paintings. There are many that also lose, but we don't have the tracking frame. Now, art is a passion investment with both quantifiable and unquantifiable benefits. There's certainly a so social return when you're in the art community. People think that you're socially connected and whatever. There's a lot of, well, you get a lot of enjoyment of looking into the paintings also. You belong to a certain sector of society and there's this whole sense of act, act, affluence. Now, in terms of quantifiable returns, it's a bit difficult because there are no indexes no, for art, as I will talk about later. It provides a hedge against inflation in current devaluation. Philippine art is slowly getting accepted in the global market. So you could beg a dollar price to a lot of the Philippine artists. In fact, their databases would do so. If you purchase wisely, there is less risk of losing your principal. Well, if you purchase by price, if you wisely, if you buy it at a decorative price, then chances are it will not go below your acquisition price. But if you buy at a high, then you can also lose some of it. No minimum investment is required. We have an affordable art fair that comes up every February, March in Salcedo Park where the cap is at 40,000 pesos. So unlike all the other investments, you can buy something for 10,000 pesos. Uh, there was a painting that a friend bought for 40,000 pesos 10 years ago and he sold it recently for 12 million. But that's one of the more successful ones. There are a lot of no success stories also. Art investments enjoyable, favor favorable tax treatments. Um, for estate planning, for example, there's no zonal value okay, for art. So the BIR will agree to an appraisal from the National Museum, which is usually low, so it's easy to pass. I'm a lawyer. A lot of us lawyers, we have the philosophy that if we don't go out, we're not going to make money. There's no recurring income. So we have to have passive investment. Some of us believe that art in our offices can be treated as furniture. Since it's treated as furniture, we can depreciate it over three years. That's some of us. There's less risk because of a low correlation with other financial assets. Um, this is something that's not that established, but as compared to the stock market, it doesn't move at the same time. Although. I must say that art is something with is based on excess liquidity also. So general economic factors come in, but the sector that invests in the most high-end art is usually free from any economic downfall. Less risk because of low, yeah, I just mentioned that. Art can be insured. Unlike other financial assets, you can actually insure art um, one of the top insurance companies for that would be Malaya, which is related to this company, because they've hooked up with the number one art insurer in the world, that's Willis. They insure the seams and whatnot. Illiquid. I have over 200 paintings. Um, one of my best friends owns the biggest auction house. That being said, I only have three paintings for sale in this next auction. So it's not something that you can dispose of once. So the recent Christie's visit me and the other days. Now that's on the auction level. It's even harder at the private sale. There are very few people who buy art at a private sale, and it's really a case of baratan. It's almost embarrassing to go into a private sale context. So the secondary market for art is quite difficult. No. Lack of cash flows until you actually sell the art, unless and unless some companies paying to exhibit their art or whatnot, you will not have any cash flows, positive cash flows. In fact, there are negative cash flows because, as I will talk about later, there are expenses that are later. Prevalence of insider trading. Art is highly unregulated. So what happens is collectors boost particular artists, and some of them even boost auctions. That being said, the prices can be, in a way, swayed also, because there are tastemakers who will push prices one way or another. There's a lack of index of all sales. This is something that Sotheby's and Christie's is, is spending so much money on, on new algorithms and whatever, whatever. But the reality is the current indexes in place are all based on auction endings, because there's no data on private sales. And so there's no way to track 
I mean, we have all the databases, even Philippine artists or in the international databases, but there's no, it's not like a PSDI where you can actually track historical performance or not. It's highly um, non transparent. The hidden expenses of maintaining an art portfolio. Most of my friends don't have walls anymore. And we're investing all in storage. I pay about for an air conditioned storage space about 23,000 pesos a month. And that only fits me a third of my collection. So there are all sorts of issues. And then there's the question of insurance. Are you going to insure also? Um, Insurance policies for her have so many conditions where they will not pay you. You have to control the humidity, things like that, and whatever. So it's, it's quite difficult. Filipinos don't like paying money for portraits. So the Mona Lisa is actually a portrait, but because of the historical value, they don't look it. There's a bias against paper. Is it valid? Probably. Because of our humidity issues, paper, watercolors, and whatnot. Get a lower value, won't strictly in the Philippines because it's so hard to conserve. I have a wall in my house of Fernando Zotos, which I've only bought for 200,000 pesos. An oil painting for Fernando Zotos, that same house would be like, that same size would be like 12 million. Authenticity. There have been a lot of fakes lately. It's all chronicled in media, and you can see it. And, um, it's, they're getting better and better, so it's getting much more difficult. Contemporary versus masters. Um, as you can see, there's a trend of people buying contemporary art. But the problem is we don't know what's going to happen to the guy. He could become a drug addict, he would stop working or whatever. I recently bought a painting from a guy who had stopped painting for 50 years. He was the mentor of all of these other guys. He worked for the Luz Gallery, the Rodolfo Gang. But he had to stop working as an artist he had to support his family. So when he was still a contemporary artist, he was really sought after. He was the mentor of all these other guys. And he had a comeback show last year. Only to, well, he sold out the show or whatever, but there was a, you know, it's a big risk because you don't, since there's no continued patronage, it doesn't work that way. Lack of materials for provenance. We really lack art critics and whatnot. To me, the best provenance now are the auction catalogs and the titles and whatnot. And we're lacking all our, ex our experts are slowly dying. But who can show where the art pieces came from? And since there's a problem with authenticity, then all the more we need provenance. I would rather buy something that came from one of my friends who I know is a real thing than buy some of something from the internet that I don't, don't know where it came from. The National Cultural Heritage Act. This is a well-meaning law which put a cap on all cultural heritage. The problem with it is it gave a right of first refusal to the National Museum. So it set a natural cap for anything that is considered a cultural heritage. So 19th century pieces. Early on in my career at Lunas and Ivalos, there's a limit to that on how much you can sell it for. Because the perception is you can't get it out of the country. And foreigners can't participate. Um, I was the underbidder for this painting. It's called España Guiando Filipinas uh, to the Future. It was the highest Luna ever. I, I was the underbidder in Spain to buy it. I lost by 10,000 euro. It eventually went to the National Gallery of Singapore, where they were able to buy it because there were no restrictions because it wasn't in the Philippines. So it went for $2.5 million to the National Gallery of Singapore, eventually. But no other Luna has gotten that price. Lack of quality appraisers. There's a bit of conflict of interest because a lot of the appraisers here charge a percentage. So there's a natural problem. And the problem with appraisers is it's highly subject subjective because there are okay Amersolos and there are really good Amersolos. I'm not going to say this. Uh, pay the same price. As I mentioned, I buy paintings abroad. And that is a problem now when I repatriate. Because customs will Google your artist and look at the highest attributable price when it could be a minor piece and, you know, 
that just pick the highest. They don't even trust the invoice that comes with those of people who made a fortune card. Herbert and Dorothy Vogel. These are actually friends of friends of mine. They've passed away since. He was a postman. She was a librarian living in New York. From their salaries, they were they bought probably a huge minimalist collection. And they were known as the proletarian art collectors. They amassed something that was worth 5,000 pieces, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, just by attending shows and spending their salary. OK, this is a rival back. Mr. P bought this in the 60s for 20,000 pesos. They sold it to further founder the Founder Foundation for 65 million 408,000. So you can see the kind of returns. My good friend, Lito Camacho, our former Secretary of Finance and formerly of the Credit Suisse, and his wife, Kim. We were talking earlier about destiny. He, when he was the Finance Secretary, was sent to a trade mission in Japan and saw an exhibit of this woman named Yayo Kusama. And he didn't think about much about it, neither he or his wife. After government, he moved to Singapore. He went to his apartment that he was assigned to, and there was mail for a previous tenant. The mail was an invitation to the art exhibit of Yayo Kusama. That led him to buying his first Kusama. And as usual, timing is everything. He bought it before Kusama exploded. He's now known as, he and his wife are known now as one of their, the top Kusama collectors in the world. Their Kusamas have risen between 20 to 30 times in value. And this is our former Spernine secretary saying, this has been our best performing asset by far. Better than private equity, stocks, bonds, or property. He just recently lectured on us on artist investment as well. Buy what you like is the primary rule, but throughout this journey, work on cultivating your taste. As all of us art collectors, we have tuition fees in terms of bad buys before. But the most important thing, don't buy something if you think it's cheap. Buy something if you like it, because the most expensive thing is if you keep on looking at a piece of art that you don't like, but you thought was cheap. Follow the money. Buy the art being bought by people more important than you. I'm an apolitical person, but during martial law era, everyone was buying what Imelda and her colleagues would buy. Now it's a few of my friends who are the tastemakers, Pauli Nope, Vicky Lopa, and whatever. So you follow other people and get mentors. Do not focus on buying cheap. The art market is a trophy market. Since it's highly illiquid, try to buy the most, the best piece that you can afford. Because chances are there's a reason why. That is the best piece within your life, with what you like. And since it's highly illiquid, then we stuck with that piece for some time. Huh? Flipping an art happens, but it's not as volatile. Diversify risk, taste is fickle. But with so many cases, a good buddy of mine used to be the number one artist, but he became too prolific. Ivan Acuna. Everyone has an Ivan Acuna. You go to the stock exchange, just one. Only deal with people with integrity. Since the art market is highly regulated, chances are you can be you can get into trouble easily. Consider buying some foreign art. We live in an information age with no borders and whatever, and the reality is global demand is there for certain art it is more than ours. And some of our artists can be a bit too expensive already. So the chances of getting bargains sometimes happen with foreign art. And the chances of getting a higher upside come also with more higher. So it's a diversification strategy. Again, it has to be something that you like. I want to go to the next auction. This is a young artist by the name of Kev Serga. He, this painting has a technology called augmented reality. What happens is you download an app, you train the app on this thing, and that's what happens. In your phone, the sunglasses would be worn by the woman. Kev is someone who's handled internationally now, so we expect this piece to do very well. Next, Martin Hunasan. 
This is a 5x5 five five piece from his first show. He's currently showing in Switzerland, so expect this to have a good upside. F.B. Concepcion is an artist who's passed away, but he's recently come into vogue with all of us. He's an abstractionist, and his prices are not that close. The starting of this is around 800000 and uh, a good friend of mine is one of the top collectors. I expect this to, to be a good investment. Okay, I'm going to show you here some Fernando Omar Solos from the Tapacalera Incorporada in Spain. There are good Omar Solos and there are bad Omar Solos and these ones are the best because Omar Solo had a long career that lasted all the way to the 60s and after a while he had a factory and everything so you really have to look at provenance and when you bought it. And this is the Tapacalera the Tabacalera in Spain, which was converted to a boutique hotel recently. So these pieces came from, her, from the Tabacalera. I don't know if you're familiar with Fernando Zoga. He was the founder of the Ateneo Art Gallery, uh, grand uncle of the Fernando Zoga now, and of Jaza. And this is a very unique piece because this came from one of his, his best friend when he was working in Harvard. This is his very first painting. It's a study of another painting. But it comes with a letter showing that that is his first painting. Um, which is a extreme rarity when you go to figurative zobels. Uh. In contrast, this is the last bottle. This used to be on loan to the Uchenko Museum for about 10 years. So it's actually unfinished. This happened during the time that uh, Botong was dying. There are four Camote vendors known in existence, this being the last one. And for whatever reason, it all ended up with important cabinet members of, of the Mar during the Marcos era. And this one is the biggest of them all. We sold a small version of this, about this big, for 23 million before. So I don't, this is starting with 16 million, so hopefully it will do well. Okay, we have an auction coming up this Saturday. Thank you very much. I'll be here for the open forum.